Well, why don't we stand and just say a quick prayer before we get into the word today? Oh, say thank you, Lord. Thank you, I was Lord. able to get out of the driveway this morning. And I'm here to hear your word today. I ask that you touch my heart and change my life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Awesome. Wow. So this, uh, this morning, just wanted to take a, a few minutes to go over some, uh, some vision and values for our church. Uh, spend a bit more time on it next week because we'll have more people here next week. But um, I really feel that like God's given me a word for today. So we're going to tap into that this morning. And so last Saturday night, I had a leadership meeting uh, with, with the directors of each department in the church. Um, we met at the, the Lose's place over at um, the King's Inn. And the purpose of that meeting was just to go over the mission, the vision, and the values of the church and to strategize and how we can make that or bring that and birth that through every department of our church, okay? And we believe it's really important. We're going to bring up our slideshow there, Brian. Um, we, we believe that um, mission, vision, and values are very important for, uh, for any organization, for an organism like the church, and also even for family. You know, your family, you should have a, you should have a mission as a family. You should have a vision. You should have values. And we all have values, but we need to identify what they are. All right? And so our first, our, did you come, you got the PowerPoint there? We'll just wait a minute to bring that up. Um, and so our mission as a church um, is to live like Jesus and share his love. Okay, we really believe that that is a, a really safe place to be because, you know, many times when I read through the Gospels, I see Jesus living, acting, doing, saying things that sometimes I don't see in the life of Christians. How many know what I'm saying, right? And so I think it's a safe place to say, you know what, listen, we've learned things, we've picked up things. Those of us who have been in the church for a while, who've been Christians for a while, we've kind of picked up certain ways of doing life that really in some ways, don't line up with Christ and the way that he lives. So I think it's a safe place to live like Jesus and to share his love. And so here we go. we got something coming up. Okay? We don't. Okay. Well, don't worry about it, Brian. Just we'll go to the scriptures after, okay? Um, so so we, believe, we believe that uh, our mission is, is, to, is to live like Jesus and to share his love, okay? Um, but values are important. Values are... Uh, what your culture as a church or what you are striving to be, okay? Okay, here, here we got some PowerPoints here, good. Uh, what your culture strives to be, who you are. And so as a church, we have values. Uh, as a people, we have values. Uh, a vision is a one sentence that describes a desired end result and where, where we want to go. A mission is a one sentence that describes what you do, okay? And... Um, <clears throat> We see in John chapter 15, verse 1 to 8, and we're not going to bring the scripture up. I'm going to summarize it. Jesus is talking to, and he's saying, listen, he said, you know, unless you abide in me, I'm the vine. You guys are the branches. And if, if you abide in me, you're going to bear fruit. But if you're cut off from the vine, you cannot bear fruit. Because life flows through the vine into the branches, and we are those branches, right? And so he's saying, you know, you, you have to, and he's metaphorically saying, you have to remain in me. The source of life comes through me from the root system, right? And the Bible says we're to be rooted and grounded in, in love. Everything we do has to be, the love of God has to be flowing through us. And, and I, I shared this at the director's meeting. I said, what happened was many years ago, for many years, there was a group of people in Trenton, maybe you were one of them, who got together, just like a little seed, and, and you began to pray for God to do something, to birth something in Trenton. Okay, And it's like that little seed that's planted in the ground, and eventually it cracked out, and what's the first thing that comes out of that seed? is a root. And, and, and so the more we pray, the more we seek God, the more the roots go down deep. And so there was a prayer. God, bring, bring, come and reveal yourself in this region. Come do something in this area, God. Do a new thing. And so there's this prayer going forth. And then God appoints. God always appoints a, a man. He appoints a leadership team. He appoints people to come in with that gift to hear his vision, his mission, and, and uh, his values that he wants to birth. Do you hear what I'm saying? And he speaks, and then all of a sudden, this stem starts to come up. 
And that's the mission and the vision and the values that God birthed through prayer and intercession to bring branches or life into this region. Amen. Amen. We can go to the next slide there. Okay, and we see that here in the slide. Here you got the root system, which is prayer ministry, right? We're rooted and grounded in the love of God. The trunk is the values and the visions and the missions of not just this church, but many churches in this region are like trees, all planted, and every tree has a different vision. They, they sli- the values are slightly different. There's a different mission, but guess what? It's all rooted and grounded in love. We're supposed to be, right? And then out of those vision, out of the vision, out of the values, out of the mission, the branches begin to, f- to flourish. We're the branches, okay? The branches produce leaves. We talked about that last week. Produces fruit, which is the fruit of the Spirit. And we become a fruitful tree in the kingdom, okay? So if you come in part of this church and you say, listen, I don't agree with your values. I don't agree with the vision. I'm going to do my own thing. Guess what? It's like you're severed from the vision. You cannot produce fruit. If you come into a church and try to do your own thing, you can't produce fruit unless you're connected to the vision and the values and the mission of the church that was birthed in prayer by the Holy Spirit. Amen? And that's why church splits happen. People come and they join a church and they just have their own ideas of how the church should run. And it's not that it's right or wrong, but they just say, we're going to go in this direction and we want to be more like this. And they, they rally a few people to themselves and they go off and they, there's a church split, right? Because they're not connected to the vision and the values and the missions of what God is doing in a region. Okay? Let's go to the next slide. Okay? But the thing is here... We have to understand that values are true spiritual riches. If you want to be rich, if you want to have the richness of God in your life, you have to have the values of God in life. Does it make sense? And so we have, we have uh, the word riches, which is our acronym to really describe what our, uh, our, our values are as a church. So the first one is relational. Say relational. Okay? Everything we do, we want to do out of relationship. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, Paul says, For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. And so God wants us to be a church. One of the things we value is relational discipleship. That's why four years ago we started the Connect Groups. How many remember when we started those? And the whole purpose of those groups wasn't just to have another Bible study. It was to sit down and do life together to share stories, to pray for one another, to prophesy over one another. That was the purpose, so we could connect. And how many here in this room, I know there's a lot of people missing today, would slip up your hand and say, you know, I've grown in my relationship with my brothers and sisters. I'm going to see your hands, okay? God is doing a new thing. It's not good. And so God, God, we want to do everything through relationship. We want to reach people. We want to, you know, connect with people. We want to raise people up. Okay, mothers and fathers, not just teachers. Next slide. And the second thing is here is innovation. This is where a lot of churches uh, miss it. They're not willing to be creative and open to change their methods. I heard just recently somebody was telling me there's a church in this area somewhere. I'm not going to say where. But they still, do, they still do their service in Latin. And they wonder why they're, you know, like, what's going on? We have, to, we have to change. We don't change the message. The message is pure. The message is awesome. But we change the method so we can reach people. And that's what Paul said. Paul says, I became all things to all people so that I might be able to win some, right? When he went into Athens, what he did was he allowed people to bring things, handkerchiefs, and he would put them on his body, and then they would, take, they would come back and get the handkerchief, and they would go home, and the healing power that was on Paul's life would go home with them, and they'd get healed. The reason he did that is in Athens, what they, they had a religious tradition. They'd go into the temple of Diana. They'd go into the temples of their, their gods, and they would bring items, and they would put it at the altar, and the priest would bless it, and then they would come, and they'd take it back, and it would bring a blessing into their home. So Paul says, hey, I'm going to just use their custom. You know how you're bringing all your stuff and all your cloths and everything, and you're bringing them to the temples? Bring them to me. I'll show you what God will do. And he, he, he adapted to their culture so that they, they could, so he could reach them. Does that make sense? Okay? And so what I don't understand is so many denominations put energy and time into training their missionaries 
Say, when you go overseas, you know, don't try to bring your culture over there because it's not going to work. You need to go over there, learn the culture of the land, right? And then go in there and, and, and bring the message into their culture. But then the same churches over here, we, we, we won't do the same. We have to adapt to our culture. How many know we're missionaries in, in, in this culture? Amen? So we need to be innovative. We need to be creative. We need to try new things. We need to say, God, we want to reach people. We want to share the gospel. We want people to hear it. Okay? Next one is, is character. Character is doing the right thing when no one's looking. It's really a modern word for holiness, being set apart. And, you know, we do encounter weekends. We do the highway to wholeness. Um, and the reason why we do these things is to develop the character of Christ in us. And we're going to continue to do those things. We're going to continue to work on character and being sanctified. Amen? That's very, very important to us as a church. How many think that's important? How many have been to an encounter weekend? Right? And, and it, just, it, just, it just sanctifies you. It gets you to a deeper place with God. The next one. Okay, is honor. So we're spelling the word riches. Relation, relationship, innovation, character, honor. Romans 12.10 says this, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another. And so we want to, we want to just as Paul is telling us here, we want to give preference to one another. I don't want to hear a bad report about someone in the church. Uh, if you have an issue with that person, go talk to them. Go, go and make, just, the Bible says, listen, if you're going to bring your, your gift to the altar, you know, go back and make things right first with your brother, and then go and give your gift to God. And so honor is very important. We want to honor other churches. We want to honor one another. We want to we be supportive of one another. This is what the love of Christ looks like. Amen? We want to value people enough to go directly to them. And the next one is, do not receive an accusation against an elder except by two or three witnesses. There's a, the enemy wants to tear down the leadership of churches, so accusations start flying. It happens all the time. And don't receive it. Say, no, I'm not gonna, unless you've got evidence or proof or somebody else can come, and let's go talk to that elder. Right? So Paul's telling us how important honor is in the kingdom of God. The next one is excellence. Okay? We believe that uh, Daniel... Uh, distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps because an excellent spirit was in him and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. Why? Because he had a spirit of excellence. And so we want, it's, we, it's not about being perfect. It's not about having everything together. But it's about saying, listen, I want to give God my best. Amen? When I'm, when I'm worshiping, I want to give him my best. When I'm uh, spending time, I'm going to give him the best part of my day. Right? Uh, when I'm serving uh, in the kids' ministry or different areas, uh, if I'm a greeter, I'm going to come and I'm going to give my best. I'm going to have an excellent spirit because God deserves it. That's what we're aiming for. And the next one is S, right? Um, let's go to S. Servant leadership, okay? Jesus handed out towels, not titles, right? Jesus was about, Matthew 23, verse 11, says, But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And so these are the visions, these are the values of our church. These are the things that are really, really important to us as a church. And um, our DNA, I'm just going to read through some of these things here. We're a spirit contemporary. People say, what kind of church? We're a spirit contemporary, non-denominational church. The word contemporary means marked by a characteristic of the present period. You're modern, you're current. Okay? At least we're trying to be. So we're, we're, we're engaged with our culture, we're making changes, but we're spirit-filled and we're preaching the word. We're contemporary, but we're a non-denominational church. We're a word-based church. We believe in divine healing. This is who we are as a church. Okay? Next one. Our vision is to, click the next one, reach people, make disciples, raise leaders, and plant churches. So we want to reach people, we want to make disciples, we want to see leaders being raised up, and we want to plant churches. That's what our heart is. We want to extend the kingdom of God. And the next one is our mission statement, which is this, live like Jesus and to share his love. So how many can say it now? So we're going to take the word riches. R means 
Okay? I means? C means? H is? E is? And S is? Servant leadership. And so what I'd like to do uh, this morning is just take a few minutes to look at uh, the life of Jesus, about 15 minutes, and then we'll close this up. Go, to, go with me to Luke chapter 9, verse 46. Now, Luke chapter 9 is an interesting chapter because, uh, as you know, Jesus has already picked his 12 disciples, right? So he's got his crew, he's got his guys that he's going to be working with, and he's been discipling them in relationship, okay? Remember, relational discipleship. The Bible says he he chose 12 men so that they might be with him. So he was living, they were living with him, they were moving with him, they were traveling with him, right? And uh, so, so they're learning the tricks of the trade, okay? I shouldn't say the tricks, because there's no tricks, but they're learning how to do ministry, right? Okay, so so here's what happens. In in, in chapter 9, verse 1, it says, He called his 12 disciples together, and he gave them power and authority over all devils to cure diseases, okay? And then he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And so here's here's a group of guys, uh, teenagers, Okay, 17, 18, 19 year olds, like they were young, okay? And, and, and they're walking with Jesus, and they're like, we get to hang out with the Messiah, and he's doing miracles, he's healing people, he's doing all this stuff that no one's ever seen before. And then all of a sudden he says, oh, boys, by the way, I know you're young and you've only been with me a short time, but he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray on you, and I'm going to release the authority, and you're going to do what I'm doing. Now, how many would think it would get to your head a little bit? I mean, you're walking with a guy who's doing supernatural miracles, and then all of a sudden he, he does this blessing thing over you. I don't know what it looked like or how he did it, but he, he prayed for them, and then all of a sudden it's like they're going out, and they're doing the same stuff he's doing. They're going out, they're, they're praying for people, they're preaching the gospel, they're, they're having all of this success, and they're like, wow, God, you know, this is awesome. And then we see, as we read on in, in chapter 9, that Peter has this amazing confession where, where Jesus comes and says, hey man, who do men say that I am? And Jesus says, you're the, uh, Peter says, you're the son of the living God, right? And Jesus is like, man, you're hearing God now. So Peter's thinking, I'm doing miracles. Now I can hear the Father for myself. I don't really, you know, I used to have to hear it through Jesus. Now I'm hearing, I've, I've got a direct connect, Wi-Fi connection with the Father. He's talking to me. I'm hearing his voice. I'm casting out devils. I'm healing the sick. And then after that, Jesus takes three of the disciples And he says, I want you to come check this out. And they're on a mountaintop. And Elijah and Moses appear. And Jesus turns into like a lightning bolt. And they're all like, they're all freaking out. They're thinking, wow, this is amazing. Okay, so they're having all of these encounters. All of these things are happening to these 12 guys. Right? And then they go off and they see this demoniac boy that nobody can heal gets delivered. And so they're, they're, in the, they're seeing stuff they've never seen. They're doing things they could never do. And then it takes us to verse 46. We're going to go to Luke chapter 9, verse 46. So a dispute arose among them, the 12 disciples, as to which of them would be the greatest. All right? Um, this, is, this is an issue. All right? All um, right? And and Jesus, perceiving their thoughts of their heart, took a little child and set him up before him and said to him, whoever receives this little child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me, for he who is least among you will be the greatest. So I want you to say this. The first adjustment's coming. Now, I I find this amazing because Jesus is not like a lot of us, right? He doesn't wait for people to be perfect before he uses them, okay? These guys are, you know, they're healing the sick. They're doing all these miracles. And then they're sitting down and having a conversation about who's the greatest. You know, I'm greater than you. You know, no, you're, could you imagine that at a pastoral meeting? All the pastors get in there. I think I'm the greatest in the kingdom. No, I think my church is better than your church. You'd be like, I'm not following these monkeys, you know. But Jesus is working with these guys, right? And they're arguing about who's the greatest, and then Jesus does something really cool, is he makes an adjustment, okay? And he uses the word receive. 
Whoever receives a little child, that word receives means to take the hand of, to take up, to basically to mentor. Okay? And how many know that uh, when it comes to children, um, how many have children here? Let me see your hands. We have children. Now, when you have kids, right, to take the hand of a child and raise them up, guess what? You've got to feed that child. You've got to clothe that child. You have to discipline that child. I mean, you have, to, you have to put money in that child's bank for their future. I mean, how many know it, it, there's a lot of work. It, it, it's a serving thing that takes place. And so he's saying, you, you, if you want to be a leader in the kingdom of God, it's like you've got to take a child and you have to raise that child up. And how many know when you're raising up a child, you're not doing it for your own status? You're not thinking, hey, when I raise this kid up, it's going to make me popular and great. Right? It's a, it's, it's a service of love. And it's birthed out of love. And you're pouring into this child. You're giving to this child, okay? And so, uh, so, so God wants us to, to serve. God wants us to raise people up like we take a child and take care of their needs and change your diapers and deal with their messes and all this stuff. And, and, and Jesus is saying, this is what it looks like to be a servant, in the, a leader in the kingdom of God, is you need to serve. You've got to raise up. You've got to feed. You've got to... Take care of their messes, and you've got to do it. And it's not for your own status. It's to be a blessing to see their life better. Amen? We pour all this stuff into our children. Why? Because we want them to have a good future. We want them to have a good job. We want them to meet a great spouse, right? And so we pour in. It's a service of love. And Jesus is saying, this is what it needs to look like, okay? Um, In John chapter 13, verse 3 to 9, Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table. He took off his robe. He wrapped a towel around his waist. He poured water into a basin, and then he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that he had tied around him. And so the next verse says, do we have the next verse up there? Okay, so anyway, so, so Jesus came to Simon Peter and said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you don't understand how, what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. In other words, if you want to be part, if you want to be part of my leadership team, if you want to be part of what I'm doing, then you have to do things the way I do things. And Jesus, the very God of the universe, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy, the Jesus, part of the Godhead came down to live among men and came down, took a towel off, got on his feet and washed the feet of his disciples. And he said, if you want to lead in my kingdom, you have to do it my way. You have to serve. John chapter 15, verse 15 says, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you're my friends since I have told you everything that the Father told me. And so we need to understand that in the kingdom of God, it's about relationships. Jesus wants to be our friend. He just doesn't want to be your master. He is our master, but he's also our friend. And he wants to tell us what the Father's doing. He wants us to have a relationship. He wants us to come and serve like he serves. We know in biblical days that the lowest person in the home, the the servant with the lowest status, would be there to wash guests' feet as they came in because they wore sandals and they had exhaust fumes from the vehicles all stuck in their toes, right? And... uh, (laughs) And, and somebody had to clean their feet, and that's what that servant would do. And Jesus says, you know what? I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to do the job nobody wants to do, the job that nobody gets recognition for. And that's the heart of our Lord. Amen? Amen. So uh, that was the first adjustment. You must be willing to raise people up. You must be willing to be mothers and fathers raising up sons and daughters. It's not about who you are or your ministry. Or, you know, it, none of that matters. What matters is that you're a mother and father. So the second adjustment, say second adjustment. <laughs> Luke chapter 9, verse 49, the very next verse. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in your name, and we forbade him. Okay? We said, don't do it. 
because why he didn't follow he doesn't follow with us okay and, and this is this is what he was basically saying jesus you know you know back in the beginning of chapter nine there a few days ago you were sending us out and he said you know you you prayed over us and you gave us authority and we had to follow you and walk with you and we know your ways and and you've given us authority well there's somebody else who's not part of our group like, who do they think they are? They were probably sitting on the mountainside in Matthew chapter 5, listening to your Sermon on the Mount, and now they think they can do this thing, and they're out praying for people in your name. How could they possibly? They're not part of our inner club. They're not part of the Jesus denomination. And Jesus says, <laughs> Jesus said to him, don't forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. All right? So Jesus the second thing Jesus does, a correction, is Jesus forbids sectarianism. He forbids denominational division. He forbids it. He's basically saying, if people are out there trying to share Jesus, they're out there trying to get people saved, they're out there with my message, leave them alone and stay in your lane. And there's so much of that in the body of Christ. I'm blown away when I go online sometimes to see how much fighting there is in the body of Christ about theology, mostly. And people saying, well, these churches, uh, they don't believe right, so they're going to hell, and these churches, and it's like, it's just a mess. How many, how many have seen that stuff? And that's from the pit of hell. It really is. And, um, yeah, but you don't understand, Pastor. There's, they, you know, they have wrong motives, and, and it's, and you know, they're they're raising money, and, the, and you know, God, you know, this is this is terrible what they're doing, and they're drawing people astray. So I got to expose them. No, God did not call you to be the police of His kingdom. He called you to get busy and do what God's called you to do. God will take care of that mess. He really will. Paul the apostle deals with this in Philippians chapter one. Verse 15 to 18, as he's in prison for preaching the gospel, look what he says. It is true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, okay? Uh, but others about Christ, are preaching about Christ with pure motives. So there's two groups of people. They preach because they love me, for they know that I have been appointed to defend the good news. So he's basically raised up some preachers. And he, he knows that they're believing in him. And he's, he's saying they have a great message. They have great motives. But then verse 17, those others do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They have wrong motives. Okay? They preach with selfish ambition. It's all about them. It's about, you know, what they can get out of God, what they can get out of the gospel. And they don't have any sincerity in their preaching, intending to make my chains more painful to me because... It breaks his heart. But look what he says in verse 18. But that doesn't matter whether their motives are false or genuine. The message about Christ is being preached either way, so I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. Amen. And so, if Jesus is being preached, let's focus on that. Let's rejoice. And it's one thing to say, I don't really agree with what they're teaching or the way they're teaching it, and I, we, we think this way. But to go and condemn them and the world sees you fighting against your brother, it brings division, and hell's behind it. I said hell's behind that. If Paul is the apostle, and he's coming and saying, listen, I'm not happy about it, they have wrong motives, selfish ambition, it's all about you know, having you know, this prosperity and all this stuff, and, 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 and he says, but you know what, I just thank God, but at least, at least the gospel's being preached. And I'll let God be the police, and I'm going to stay in my lane. Can I hear it? Does that make sense? Okay, all right. And so we need to stay in our lane, unless, of course, if you're called to be a five-fold prophet and to bring direction and correction in that way, that's a different thing. Okay? So let's go on to the third, third, third adjustment. Can we do one more? One more adjustment? Okay. So the first, the first adjustment is Jesus is saying, if you're going to lead, you need to be a servant. You're not going to be a dominating leader. You're going to serve. The second adjustment is that he says, I don't agree with sectarianism and denominational division. Learn to get along. Love one another. Even if you don't agree on everything, love one another. Amen. Don't forbid people that aren't part of your demonization. I mean denomination. That was a joke. Okay, let's move on. So the third adjustment, now it came to pass, when the time had come, for him to be received up. Jesus was going to go back to the Father soon. He was going to go to the cross. And he said his 
face towards Jerusalem. So he was on mission. He was, he was setting up crusades. He was going to preach and pray for people. But his main focus was like, I got to get back to Jerusalem. Okay? And he sent messengers before his face. As they went, they entered the village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. Okay? And here, here's what happened, basically. He, he traveled with probably 50 or 60 people. He had his disciples, and he had, uh, their, he had a bunch of women that walked with him. He had their wives. So he said, this is probably what it looked like, okay? This is, I'm reading between the lines. He probably said to the messengers, I want you to go ahead to Samaria. Take, take Judas. He's, he's, the, uh, he's the treasure of the board. He has the money. You go forward. I want you to book you know, 20 rooms at, at the inn. I want you to prepare meals. I want you to ha- set up a place to have meetings. I want you to go out and advertise. This is probably what happened, okay? And so they're going forward, and they're setting all this stuff up. And look what happens. And they went in, and they entered the village of the Samaritans to prepare for him to come. And when they, re- they did not receive him because he was set for the journey to Jerusalem, okay? So the Samaritans didn't want anything to do with Jesus. Because the Samaritans and the Jews were fighting together. They didn't get along. The reason why they didn't get along was because they had two different beliefs in how to worship. The Jews believed if you worship God, you went to the temple. The Samaritans believed if you're going to worship God, you have to go to the mountain where, where, um, where Abraham was offering Isaac, and that was the place to worship. And so there was a division in their theology about where and how to worship God. And so because the Samaritans said, oh, he's really on his way to worship in Jerusalem, and he doesn't believe the way we believe, and he doesn't worship the way we believe, so you know what, let him go on. And they missed their hour of visitation, right? Because they did, that Jesus didn't fit their box. And we've got to be very careful because we might think that Jesus wants to show up and do something, and he, he has to fit our box. He has to do it the way we want to do it. But you know what? If we're not careful, he'll bypass us. Okay, um, so the difference between the Jews and the Samaritans is how they worship. They rejected Jesus because he didn't fit what they wanted him to fit. But Jesus, no, Jesus wasn't too concerned about it. Do you know why? Because Jesus probably knew, if he didn't know, he wasn't worried about it, that not too long later he was going to meet a woman at a well, and he was going to share, and he was going to prophesy to her, and she was going to go and win her whole city. How, how many remember that story? So he wasn't worried about it. He's like, okay, they're rejecting me. I know we're invested. I know we sit, we, we, you know, we've probably booked these hotels. We can cancel them. You know, we've got the place booked, you know, all this stuff. But you know what? Don't worry about it. We'll just move on. But look what his disciples did, okay? This is blowing me away, okay? And so verse 54, and his disciple, James and John, saw this and said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Just like Elijah did. Let's burn them up, God. Because you know what? We're invested and we're special, you know, and, and you know, they're not, they don't want our message. Let's fry them all. I mean, we see that today, right? People don't get saved and then, they, you know, you yell at all the sinners because, you know, because they don't like, yeah, whatever. Okay. So, so look at this. <clears throat> Verse 55, and then he turned and he rebuked his disciples and said, okay, you do not know what manner of spirit you're of, okay? For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's life, but to save them. And he went to another village. So the third adjustment is we need to bring life, not judgment. Amen? Yeah, but what about, you know, we got to preach judgment all the time. No, uh, the Bible says people are already condemned because they don't believe. So we need to show them Jesus so they can believe and escape condemnation. And, and this, is, this is what Jesus said. I didn't come to condemn. The Old Testament, what was going on back there, when a lie, that was a different dispensation of time, and he was calling judgment on a group of people. And what you're doing is trying to call judgment on a, a group of people who canceled a meeting. Like, this is the wrong motive. So he's dealing with, like, how many would agree these disciples were messed up? Right? And rightfully so, because most of us would be in the same boat. If Jesus said, you know, in the beginning of chapter 9, hey, guys, you're gonna, I'm giving you authority, and we're going out doing all the miracles that Jesus did, by the end of chapter 9, we'd be messed up too. Okay? And, and this is what's happening. There was three adjustments. Number one, say servant leadership. Number two, he, Jesus rejected division and sectarianism. That's a tough one. I got gotcha. you. And the third adjustment is he wants us to bring life, not judgment. 
Amen? And so I shared that passage with you to say this is that one of our, our first values is that we're relational, and our last value is we're servant leaders, right? And Jesus was making adjustments with his leaders as he was working with them. He was in relationship with them. He was working with them. And all of us are we're in a process, just like the disciples. We're in process, and we have to love one another and disciple one another and have patience with one another. Amen? So God is good. So why don't we stand and we're going to pray. I'm going to have Garth come and just share a brief testimony. Um, do you want to come up here, brother? He just had a testimony he wanted to share with you guys. So, Okay, so, uh, you know, when you watch like 700 Club, uh, you hear... Uh, that so and so has been healed of this or that, and you wonder, like, will that ever happen to me? So, I was sitting in the booth one morning, and Pastor Travis says, uh, "There's someone here with their knee hurting them," and then he says, "It's a right knee." So, I came up, and he prayed for me. So, what I need to tell you is that when I was 22 years old, I had a an accident, a car accident where a truck hit me head on and it shattered my right leg and my knee was shattered and uh, I was uh, treated by Professor Sir John Golding who was uh, one of the best orthopedic surgeons in England and um, he predicted that later on in life uh, I would probably use uh, uh, not have the use of my knee anymore. So, like about two weeks before that, um, I said to my wife, Melanie, I says, I think my knee's done. Um, like, I couldn't, it couldn't bear weight anymore. And I was contemplating uh, not being mobile anymore. And um, just, just out of the blue. <laughs> um, God just called me, and Pastor Travis prayed for me, and he healed me. And um, there's no pain. I I don't take painkillers, or um, it's all mine. <laughs> there's nothing in there that God didn't put in there. So praise God. Amen. So God, God is a healer. And I know there's many of you would have testimony to that. So today as we end the service, uh, well, I'm just going to pray first, but after that, as we end the service, if you need prayer, our prayer team will be over in that corner. You guys can turn the lights on, by the way. And you want prayer for healing, just come over there. Our team will pray and believe with you for healing in your body. Amen? And sometimes it happens instantaneously, and sometimes it, it's, uh, it's a process. But... You know, begin the process today of putting your faith in God for your health. Amen. And so, Father, I thank you for every person here today, Lord, that heard heard uh, this word today. And I know, God, that um, just as your disciples, uh, uh, they you know they made mistakes, they needed adjustments. So do we. And but, Lord, we thank you, Father, that you spoke to our lives about areas where we need to um, just uh, make just little adjustments, God, so that we can uh, carry the values that you want this house to carry, Father. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen.